All right. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Doing all right? How could you not? The sun is shining today. It's a beautiful day. So we are glad you guys are here. Um, The Point Church, why do we exist? Why are we here? The Point Church exists to welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus, right? And we do this by pointing people to God, to worship him with everything that we have. We point people to Jesus, to not only receive, but to demonstrate or to give the love, acceptance, and forgiveness that Jesus has shown to us. And we point people to community, which is the church, in order to be able to encourage and to equip one another. So we are glad that you're here. My name is Tim Bycroft, and one of the pastors uh, that has the opportunity to be here and serve you today. Um, Let me start off by asking a question. How many of you would say that you know God? You know God, okay? Now let me ask uh, another question that kind of goes along with that. How many of you would say that you know God and at some point you've experienced God? You've experienced God in your life somehow, some way. How many of you would say, you know, honestly, I'm not sure I have ever experienced God. How many can truthfully say, you know what, I'm not even sure. Okay. But I would like to. You know, that that might be the add-on to that. I I haven't necessarily, I'm not even sure that I have experienced God, but there's, there's a part of me that would like to. And then lastly, how many of you would say that you've experienced God just radically? And from that experience, your life has changed. How many would you say, because of the experience that you had with God, that your life radically changed? Okay. Well, let's talk about this today. I'm going to jump into the deep end of the pool. I'm going to hit the gas full throttle with this passage of scripture that that Paul writes to Titus. And he says this, they claim to know God, but their actions, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, they're disobedient and unfit for doing anything good. Woo, that's the way to kick off a sermon, right? In other words, they say they know God, But how they're living doesn't show that they know him at all. They say they've experienced God, but their lack of obedience or the lack of way that they are demonstrating in their lives that they've they've experienced God is not there. And uh, I I don't know about you, but I, I think that sometimes I have fallen into that. Probably more times than I care to admit. That maybe the attitude that I've had may be detestable to God, maybe because of my disobedience and I'm unfit for even doing anything good because the author of all things good is God. So they claim to know God, but their actions deny him. In fact, I want you to know that this series that we're in right now, this is kind of, this question or this idea is rooted in this. How well do we know God? And have we experienced him? And because of that experience, do we live that way? I believe in God, but, but so many people, and, and you have to admit, right? You have to admit, I, I've heard of God. I know about God. But to be honest with you, I don't really know him. There's probably a lot of people even in, him, in this room today that would agree with that. In fact, just knowing God relationally, for some of you, seems like a far-fetched, hard thing that we would ever be able to do, to swallow. It's because many times we just don't understand the reality between the different levels of experience, experiences that we can have with God. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example of different levels of relationships and experiences that we can have with God. Okay, and this is how I'm going to start this example. How we can have and how I have had uh, an experience with God, I'm going to use my wife. (laughs) She is God. Okay, she's God in this image. However, this 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 is an example. 30 plus years ago, 
Um, I, I, I didn't know her. Actually, she will tell you that she knew me far before I ever knew her. Because I'm that good looking. I actually heard about her before I met her, though. Okay? And, and this is what I mean. I mean, I, people would come up to me and they would say, man, have you, have you ever seen her? Have you heard about her? You guys would make a great couple. You should ask her out on a date. People were doing this kind of regularly. You guys would make a great couple. Now, I didn't know about her, but I had heard about her from other people. And the truth of the matter is, is some of us, that's our relationship with God. We, we've heard about him. We, we've heard people talk. We've even said, hey, you guys would make a great couple. You should check him out. But we've kind of kept our distance and we're not there yet. They know God, but they don't know him personally. They, you know, they've heard about God. Well, Mindy and I, one day, this is how this happened. I saw her picture in the paper. My wife, yes, my beautiful wife, won the local county princess pageant. Dang straight. My wife was the prime beef queen. No jokes. No, no, no. It's not why we call her Mindy Moo. Um, so much trouble. Anyway, so her picture was her picture was in the paper. I mean, it was like a whole page of her picture, and, and I saw that. Of course, other people had been priming me and, and, and saying that maybe we would be a good couple. So I kind of knew about her. But then, then when this picture came out, my sister Holly happened to be standing right there. And I bet her $5 that I could get a date with this girl in the, page, in the paper. And so I won. I asked her out and we started dating. And, and, and we started to get to know each other, right? Through this dating process. We start getting to know each other and we're just kind of dating each other. There, there's a lot to find out about each other, right? Good questions. <coughs> Does she like me? Does he like me? Does she like to go fishing and hunting? Will he watch chick flicks? Does she know how to cook? Does he know how to do laundry and dishes? I mean, there's a lot of questions you're trying to find out. And this back and forth thing uh, of discovery is taking place, which I think there's a lot of people, we do this with God as well. You know, we, we start kind of dating God, flirting with God, and we start asking a lot of questions of God and, and trying to figure out who he is and, and why he does what he does in our relationship. And, and sometimes we get to a point where like, whoa, hey, I'm not sure this is the right relationship that I need to have because it seems like God is asking a little bit too much from me right now. And I'm not sure I want this. Or on the other hand, maybe you really take off in your relationship with God like Mindy and I did. And we got married. We decided to get married. Okay. And, and now, 30 some years into our marriage, I will tell you that we know each other intimately. Very, very well. I mean, we know each other inside and out. If there's literally, and some of you guys who have been married a long time will, will recognize this. If there's a room, there could be a room of a hundred women in the room and I can find my wife's voice in the midst of it. Matter of fact, we've got this little code. It goes something like this. Psst. My wife does. Psst. I can hear that in a rock concert. I can hear that. <laughs> and I better. <laughs> Right? I know her likes. I know her dislikes. I know her expectations of me. And I will tell you, after 30 plus years, this is what I will say. That I, I know and I long to be with her. That's the kind of relationship. There's a, there's a growing intimacy that we have with each other. I don't know everything there is to know about her, but I probably know more than anybody else on this planet about her. But it's growing and it's still growing. And that's where I think some of you are with God as well. 
You've, you've dove headlong into this relationship, and over the years, it has grown, and it has grown, and it has grown, and your intimacy level with each other has just grown to a point where you long to be with God. Am I right? Please tell me there's a few of you in here that that's where you're at. Yes. Thank you. I was about to lose hope. What I'd like to do today is maybe break down. Maybe break down some of where we're at in our relationship of experiencing God and, and talk about that. And, and maybe decide where are we and maybe where we need to go in this relationship. And I want to talk about maybe just three different levels that I hope, here's, here's my hope, that you can be honest with yourself and with God about. Okay? If there was any, if there was any place to be honest, you would think it would be church. <laughs> right? I hope so. Because here's the thing. I think if we're honest with ourselves and, and we're honest with God, I think God wants to develop our intimate relationship with him at a deeper level than probably where we're at. All of us. Okay? And so let's just dive in. I think that there are some people who believe in God, but they just don't know him. They believe in God, but they just don't know him. I, I, you know, some people would say, well, I believe in Jesus. Here, <laughs> I, I hear this all the time, and, and, and there's a part of it. There's a part of it that's very true. Someone will come to me and say, well, I believe in Jesus. Isn't that enough? It's not. It's not. <laughs> Belief alone starts the relationship. That's like the initial step in understanding who God is. I believe in who he is. I believe who Jesus is. But the brother of Jesus, his name is James, he says, hey, even the demons believe in who Jesus is. They know and they shudder. So belief alone isn't, isn't it. Believing in God simply isn't it. And I would say that sometimes what happens is, is that we're, that's where we stop. I believe in Jesus. And, and I think what can easily happen is we can become cultural Christians. Christians by name alone. Well, I believe, therefore I am a Christian. You know, um, my mom was Catholic. My dad was Methodist. And now I'm just a little confused. But hey, I'm, I'm a Christian. Or, you know, the CEO Christians, those who come on Christmas and Easter only. We appreciate them. But sometimes they would say, well, isn't that enough? I, sh I showed up to church on Christmas and Easter. Isn't that enough? <laughs> or, or some people would say, well, I do, I, I try to do some really good things and I try not to do bad things and, and most of the time anyway. And so it, it, doesn't that count for something? And there's a God, and, and I believe that, and, and Jesus seems really cool, but this whole Bible thing, if i got, if I got to follow this stuff in the Bible, woo, we're off the tracks now. I believe in God, and, but their reactions are revealed, or their intent is revealed in the lack of intimate knowledge of who God is. I think there's a real telling passage of Scripture that Jesus uses to describe this. It's found in uh, 1 John 2. And John says this. We can be sure that we know him. Talking about God. How can we be sure that we know God? And he spells it out. If we obey his commandments. If someone claims, hey, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living the truth. Hey, oh. How do we know God? By obeying his commandments. These are God's words. Let, let, me, let me spell this out. Belief without obedience means there's no relationship. I mean, if you, think about, you think about the marriage relationship. Let's go back to that a little bit. If there's expectations that my wife has of me, and I know what those expectations are, or if I have expectations of my wife and she knows what those expectations are, but she never follows through with those expectations and I never follow through with the expectations that she has on me, how good of a relationship would that be? At some point, she's going to say, Phew, get out. Right? 
We, we, we want to serve one another. We want to be in relationship with each other. We want to submit to one another. And it may not be that there, people are lying. When, 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 when John says that they're lying, they may not be lying to other people. The person that they may be lying to the most is themselves. The scripture says they're lying. The reality is there's a lot of people who know some about God, that they know about God, but they don't really know God. Now listen, this is, okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick on some people, okay? And, 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 and you know these people, okay? <laughs> and, and I probably shouldn't call them this, but it just, I do. I, I call them my friends who are barstool theologians. I love them. I love hanging out with them. I really do. They can quote the Bible and, and they, they can quote all kinds of historical facts about what has happened in the past with the church and this, that, and the other. And, and it seems to me like they have a really good head knowledge about religion and maybe even about God, but it's never transferred from up here to here. And there's a lack of obedience to what they know and how they live. And I sit there and it's interesting. Do you know, I don't know if you've uh, experienced this or not, but if, if you go and you hang out at the local watering hole, the local establishment, you know there's always three subjects. If you hang around long enough, and you know I'm right, if you hang around, there's three subjects that are going to be brought up around the bar. You know what those three subjects are? You can probably name the first two. Sex, politics, and I guarantee you, if you stay there, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of crazy. But somehow, religion or God will be brought up. It just, it just happens. And I love it. And, and some of these brilliant scholars or theologians of the Bible start spouting off things. And, and what's interesting to me is that some of it is truth and a lot of it is not so true. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of m mystical Theology tied in there. May sound good, totally complete, but it's inaccurate. So all I'm saying is this. I'm not saying to dismiss the barstool theologian. What I'm saying is be very careful. Be very careful. Because they know about God, but the question is, do they really know God? And I'm not saying all of them don't, don't get me wrong. Because I love hanging out with them. Believe me, I do. But here's the thing. I've met so many people who sound like they know what they're talking about when it comes to God. But their belief is not revealed in the life that they're living. And, and so there's a part of me that goes, yeah, you know about God, but do you really know him? Because if you did, I, I'm not sure that these things in your life would be happening. One of the most sobering verses in scripture is found in Matthew chapter seven. These are Jesus' words. Now watch this. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, hail. Not everybody who cries out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do, what is it? The will of the father in heaven will enter. Wow, there we go again with this whole obedience thing. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Now watch this list. This is a pretty impressive list. They prophesied in Jesus' name. They cast out demons in Jesus' name. They healed people in Jesus' name. Okay, that's a pretty impressive list. Some of us probably can't even say, hey, we prophesied in Jesus' name. We, we cast out demons in Jesus' name. We healed people in Jesus' name. Some of us, our list may be a little bit more like, you know what? I went to school, Sunday school when I was a kid. Some of us might be, I got confirmed as a child. I, I dedicated our children in the church. I've, 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 I've done some pretty good things. I, I've even been nice to some people. I've been generally moral in my life. I gave a dollar to that dude ringing the dingling bell outside Walmart. 
I, you know, we, didn't we do some, Jesus, Lord, Lord, did, didn't we do some generally good things in your name? And Jesus, in verse 23, he says, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's laws. You say you know me, but you didn't really know me. You may have knew about me, but you never really let me in. We weren't really in a relationship. And I think that grieves the spirit of God. Therefore, I believe so many people, so many good people who believe in God, but they do not know him personally. And one of the ways that we know him personally is if we obey his commandments. If we obey his commandments. There, there's this connection between belief and obey. Man, we don't want to talk about this in church very often, do we? This is rough stuff. All of a sudden we go from relationship with God, which is awesome and salvation and, and strength and power and peace. And, and I love preaching these things. I really do. But the truth of the matter is, if there is no obedience, we are not believing fully in God, who is the savior of our lives. They go hand in hand. Here's a sobering thought. Some of you, some of you, I, I think you have to admit this is where you are. There may be some of you in here today, this is where you are. You believe in him, but there, let me put it this way. You believe in God. He's checked your get out of free, get out of jail or hell free card. He's punched that ticket for you. But he's not the driving force of everything in your life. And he wants to be. He needs to be. He deserves to be. You should want him to be when you get to know him. So here's my challenge. If that's you, if that's you, acknowledge it. I, I, I think it just starts there going, yeah, that's me. I, I know about God, but I'm not sure that I know God. I, I like the idea and the concepts of God, but then following and obeying God, ew, that's a different story. So maybe for you today, the first step is just simply acknowledging, hey, this is where I'm at in my relationship with God. Because I believe that the spirit of God, once you reveal that and acknowledge that and say, God, I am not, I'm no longer satisfied with where our relationship is. I want to take it deeper. Can I tell you something? That I believe this wholeheartedly, that the spirit of God will begin to transform you today. He will. If you give him a shot to do so. Because there's another group that I'm going to talk about today for just a minute. And maybe a lot of you in here today or some of you in here today would say, yeah, I'm kind of in this category as well. They believe in God and they do know him, but not real well. Kind of superficial. Maybe you've had an experience with God and maybe you've prayed and, and God started to transform your life and you, you start to have kind of this basic understanding of the relationship that you have with him. And, and there was a time though that you felt really close and tight with God through Jesus Christ. And now all of a sudden you feel like, whoa, there's some real distance here. What happened? He's not the leading and driving force of every part of my life like he wants to be. You have some knowledge, but to be honest with you, your life really didn't change. And what I would say is this. Many times what we do is we get informed. We get informed about who Jesus is. We get informed about who God is, but we never allow him to transform our lives. And there's a big difference between information and transformation in our lives. And Jesus was the transformer. You know him, but maybe you're more like casual friends. He may be your personal idol, but you haven't radically, fanatically allowed him to change you by the renewing of your mind. You might say, well, Tim, 
come in because I may have got some of you <laughs> off the rails here for a minute. Please hear me. Because some of you might be sitting here going, man, am I saved? Am I saved? Number one, please don't ask me that question because I'm not the judge, luckily. And neither are you, luckily. Right? That'd be a tough thing to judge. But I will say this. I will say this, that God is with you no matter how far you've traveled from him. God is always with you. And he's willing to transform your life. He wants to transform your life. Not just inform your life, but transform your life. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter uh, to some people. They were trapped in idolatry. They started, they started to know God. They started uh, allowing God to transform their lives, but not well enough that they didn't get sucked back into culture and back into the world. And I think this is so easily, uh, in our, especially in our culture and our world today, this is who we can easily become. Paul says to the Galatian church, he says, before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that, that don't even exist. So now that you know God, or should I put it more accurately, that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak, useless spiritual principles of this world? You know God well enough to want a relationship with him, but not well enough to not be sucked back into the, remember the traps and the dangers and the things of the past before you were a Christian? And how so hard, they're so, they're so desperately trying to draw you back into that, that lifestyle that you used to live in, that God has called you out of. And he says, don't get sucked back into that. And the only way that you can not get sucked back into that is to start pouring into this relationship, not just being informed by who God is, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Therefore, when your mind is changed, so is your life. And so for many of you, maybe today, maybe today that's you, to acknowledge that. Man, I knew God and I was, I was on fire and we were doing things and he was transforming my life and then life got hard. Or man, the pleasures of what I used to do started to draw me back in and I wasn't strong enough in my relationship with God I was informed on how to do life, but I wasn't being transformed by the renewing of my mind and I'm just getting sucked back in. So God, I need you in this moment. God, I need to seek you out where I'm at right now because it seems like the traps of this world are really pulling me back in. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge maybe that's where you are because I believe this, that that is the first step in allowing God to transform you into the lives that he wants you to be and to live and the relationship that he wants to have with you. But it starts with acknowledging it. Simple word that we use in the church is called repentance. It's, it's turning around, turning back to God during this moment. Just own it. It's time to get serious about, can I just say this? And, and I, uh, this is coming from a passion inside of me. Hopefully you're seeing that. That it's time to, in our world, in our culture, and the way things are going right now, church, we've got to stop playing games. And it's time to start, start taking seriously our relationship with God because it's only through, the power of the church changes the world. And the power of the church comes from no other than the source, which is God. And the source of God works through his church, which means he may work through me, but he wants to work through all of us. That's you. You're the church. We're the church. There's a third group, and I, and I pray that most of us fall into this category. I hope this is where you are, that we would grow to a point that there are those who believe in God, know him intimately, and serve him wholeheartedly with everything. You believe in God, you know him intimately, and you serve him wholeheartedly. You have been transformed 
He is transforming you on a daily basis into who he wants you to be. That is your act of worship to him, which this is what it means for me. I'm just gonna talk from the heart for a minute. What this means to me when God, when, when, when I submit and I surrender and I say, God, take everything that I have and it is now yours. I want you to be at the center of every decision, everything that I do. When I am in that type of intimate relationship with God, the more I'm becoming more aware of what God wants for me all the time. There is an increasing awareness of the presence and the provision and the power and the peace and the protection that comes from God. When I'm in this type of position where I believe who he is, when I want that intimate relationship with him, when I don't just know him, but I want, I don't just know about him, but I want to know him, this is what I know. It's not like God is over there and occasionally I just throw a prayer towards him. God, help me in this situation. God, this is really going bad. But it's an ongoing communication with God to know the the intimate relationship that he wants with me and for others. And he speaks to me and he speaks to you through his word. I believe that the Bible is a sword that cuts to the marrow. It is living and breathing. And if you're not in it, you need to be because that's where God will speak to you. He will speak to you through his spirit, the Holy Spirit, which the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And so through that intimate relationship, we have to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. I believe that he speaks to me through other people. Thank God he puts other godly people in my life because I need them. He speaks to me through circumstances. God orchestrates things. I see him orchestrating things. I see God sending people into my life all the time. Thank you, God. I need that. It's, it's not. When I am in the relationship with God the way it should be, it's not by sight that I live. It's, it's, it's not, by, not by the things that I see, but by the spirit of God and what he's doing in my life. I, I want to share with you um, Psalm 63. I want you to hear the intimacy that the psalmist is writing when he talks about his relationship with God. In verse one, he says, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Man, that's where I want to be. I want to long for God. In this world where there's Trust me, right? You guys know this. In a world that ultimately never satisfies, I want my hunger and my thirst and my desire to be driven towards the one who does. And that is God. I've seen you in your sanctuary. I've gazed upon your power and your glory. I've seen you. I know you. I've experienced you. I know what you're like. I know your power. I know your glory is greater than anything on this earth. I couldn't even imagine or describe my life without you, God. Verse three. Man, this is, this is powerful. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. Oh, how I praise you. Think about that for a moment. To get to a point in your relationship with God where you say, God, your love is better than anything else living today. Myself included. Your love is better than life. And because of that, all I can do is glorify you, is to worship you, is to praise you. Is to allow this relationship to grow more and more. Verse four, I will praise you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands to prayer in, to praying to you, prayer to you. Listen, I can't be quiet about you, God. I can't stop talking about you, God. I will praise you as long as I live. I will lift up your name. I will lift up my hands. God, I will seek you. I know you. I've seen you. I've experienced you. The things of this world do not satisfy. God, only you satisfy. 
And, and the reason that I know God only you satisfy is because I've experienced you. I've truly experienced you to the point where I want nothing else in this life but to experience you. Nothing in this life satisfies but you. All day long, I want to talk about you. I want to glorify you. I want to praise you. I can't stop lifting my hands to worship you because God, I've experienced you on such a level, an intimate level that my life has changed. I'm not informed by you. I'm transformed by you. And I want other people to be transformed by you. Man, I get excited about that. Can you tell? There's a passion inside of me. I want to thank God. I want to thank God for the way that he transforms my thinking about him. I want to thank God and praise God for the way that he transforms my thinking about others. I want to transform, or I want to praise God for the, the fact that he's transformed even the way that I think about myself. The renewing of my mind being transformed. Thank you, God, for everything. Now listen. Man, I hope one thing didn't come across today. That I got it all together. Because you don't have to spend much time with me to figure out that I don't have it all together. But I was the one. Yeah, Tim Bycroft, I was the one. I was the one who believed, but didn't act like I believed. There was no evidence of that belief in my life. I am the one who believed in him, but did not know him. I am the one who believed, and honestly, far more times than I care to admit, disobeyed the information. I wasn't transformed, but I will tell you, I'm also the one who experienced God. I called out to God. I cried out to God. I admitted that I needed him and I experienced him. And I am the one who's been transformed by the renewing of my mind by God. And I am the one who's had to repent more times than I care to admit. And I am the one that if there's any passion coming out of me today is because knowing him better and better, let me tell you what happens. It makes you different. You're no longer the same. I don't want to be the same. I don't want to be that guy again. As I grow to know him, I become more generous in every way. As I grow to know him, my heart breaks for the things that God's heart breaks for. As I grow to know him, I become more passionate about the fact that I really don't care what other people think about me. I care about what God thinks about me. And I care that they understand about what God thinks of them as well. As I grow to know him, I burn with a passion to tell others about him. I want others to know the same freedom and joy and peace and protection and provision and power that the Holy Spirit brings upon them when they, when they fully rely upon God. I look at things that I used to look at and it never bothered me and now things... Things that never used to bother me, now bother me. I see people who are poor, and for the first time, man, I remember when I was starting to be transformed by God. I, I, I started to recognize the poor like I'd never recognized the poor before. And I cared deeply, and all the resources that I have, man, all the resources that we have, and sometimes, sometimes it bothers me that we're not doing more. I see the orphans, I see the hurting, I see the lonely. When I, maybe the biggest thing in my life that I never want to go back, never want to lose after experiencing God, after allowing him to transform my mind is this, that when I sin against God, I gotta be honest with you, before I can brush it off, 
And now, because I know him, I know it grieves him when I sin and I'm not obedient. And therefore, it grieves me. But I'm different. I'm different. And the reason I'm different is I know him. I've experienced him. And I've allowed him to transform my life. So how do we get to know him? I'm gonna close with this. How do we get to know him? Some of you may be sitting here today and if there's anything that has bumped you, prompted you, challenged you, let me know. Let me tell you that it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit's prompting. And I believe that getting to know Jesus and getting to know God is actually the easiest part. It's simply this. If you seek him, he will find you. That's the great extent of God's love for you. That if you seek him, he will find you. Open up yourself to him, to seek him. Because I guarantee you, if you're hungry for him, he will feed you. If you're thirsty, he will give you something to drink. If you seek him, you will find him because he longs to reveal himself to you. That's the God of love. That's the God of love. You don't have to go to a class. You, I'm not going to give you seven steps to finding God. It's simply this. If you seek him, he will find you. I'm going to close today with a prayer. It's a prayer of Paul the Apostle that he prayed over one of his churches in Ephesus. And so would you just close your eyes, bow your head, and hear this prayer? I have not stopped thanking God for all of you. I pray for you constantly asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you may grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with a light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he has called. He's called us his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that, that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in, a, in, in, in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he's far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all authority under the authority of Jesus Christ. And he has made him head over all things. Why? To benefit you, the church. And the church is his body. And it is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things with everything, including himself. God, we want you to reveal yourself to us today. God, I pray if there are people seeking you that your trusted word would just be fulfilled in their lives where you just reveal yourself in a powerful way. And the powerful way in which you demonstrate yourself usually is manifested in love and grace, and mercy and forgiveness. God, when we recognize our shortcomings and that our life is messy, that we need a savior, God, help us to understand that you sent your son, Jesus, who was born without sin to become our savior. And that when we call upon him, when, when we seek him, knowing that he shed his blood for us and he rose for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord, we know that that kind of unconditional love was meant for us. So God, 
God, hear our prayer as we seek you, as we give ourselves to you. Lord, we pray that you would transform our lives. It's no more about this information. It's all about transformation in our hearts, in our lives, to be the people that you've called us to be. Thank you, God, for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and for the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Amen.